Hello, this is Manfred Krivka. You will hear an updated version of a talk that I gave at the Spagat 4 workshop sequencing and referencing speech acts in Berlin. This was one of the workshops of the project Speech Acts in Grammar and Discourse, funded by the ERC. The title of my talk is Adjacency Pairs in Common Ground Update, Assertion, Questions, Greetings and Commands. This is the abstract for the talk that you can read at your leisure. The study of communication in the last 50 years or so has been done in two different approaches. One I call the philosophical approaches and the other the empirical approaches. The philosophical approaches were informed by self-inspection of one's own linguistic and communicative competence and informal observation of communication and the goal was to construct formal models that capture aspects of communicative behavior. One important research program is speech act theory, going back to John Austin and John Searle, and another one, the notion of update of common ground, where common ground is the shared information that is assumed to be shared among the participants in conversation. Important figures are Steinacker, who assumed that we share propositional information and this has been enriched to include also the introduction of discourse reference. This research program connects to and extends the program of truth conditional or formal semantics. The empirical approaches are informed by detailed analysis of real conversations the most important branch here is conversational analysis by Sachs, Shekloff and Jefferson and others. Here the sequential organization of discourse by turn taking and interaction and so called adjacency pairs of moves that belong together are most important. And it is obvious that these two approaches should be combined in some way. Uh, there are indeed formal approaches that acknowledge turn-taking, like for example Hamblin's early paper and Arthur Marine's uh, paper. And there are empirical approaches that acknowledge the importance of this notion of common ground, like Herb Clark's theory. And there are also formal approaches that acknowledge a richer setting of conversational moves, like the, in the work of uh, Ginsberg, of Farkas and Bruce, of Venon and, and Escher, and in the paper by Hunter, Escher and Lascarides. The goals of this presentation are in the tradition of this attempt to combine different research traditions. So I will propose a model that enriches the notion of common ground with so-called adjacency pairs, um, a notion that goes back to the tradition of conversation analysis. They are composed of two terms by different speakers uh, that are sequentially ordered with a first pair part that initiates a move and a second pair part that responds to this move. Examples are questions and answers or greetings and counter greetings or offers and accept or decline offers, commands and agreeing to commands or maybe declining uh, rejecting commands but also assertions and agreeing or rejecting responses to assertions. These can be expanded or interrupted and have many alternatives in, the, in their second pair parts. So there might be more preferred ones and less preferred second pair parts. In detail, I will discuss two other models that go forward into this direction. One is the table model by Farkas and Bruce and another one, the commitment space model with commitment space developments by myself. I will in particular talk about adjacency pairs like assertions and agreeing or disagreeing responses to assertions, questions and responses, greetings and counter greetings, promises and accepting and declining uh, promises, and commands and accepting and rejecting commands. As I said, I work within the tradition of communication as changing common ground. According to this, communication takes place, as Stronacher says, against a background of beliefs or assumptions which are shared by the speaker and his audience and which are recognized by them to be so shared. 
So assertions then are incremental changes of the common ground. Within so-called dynamic semantics, meanings are modifications of information states or context change potentials. This applies to the factual information and also the introduction of discourse reference that was proposed by Kamp and Heim and Ruth and Grunendijk and Stockhoff. We can model this as the update of a common ground C, which is modeled as a set of propositions by a proposition phi, which just gives us the union of C with phi, with a set that contains phi. It should not be allowed that a proposition phi and its negation not phi are both an element of a common ground C. So if phi is an element of C, then non-phi cannot be an element of C. We can have stronger integrity constraints, like for example, that the intersection of the propositions in C should be not empty. This means that C is not contradictory. We can also choose to allow for certain contradictions, but I don't go into this matter here. Now, this is a picture of update of um, common grounds with a proposition like a move in a game, like in a game of Go, for example, where the white stone can be captured by black in this move. But of course, communication is not like a brute force move in a game that the opponent doesn't have a say in it, has to just accept this move. Rather, with assertions, we propose something. So we have propositions as proposals to change the information states that can be accepted or rejected. And this applies also to other moves like um, commands and offers and so on. This aspect uh, has been, of course, discussed by Stalniger as well, uh, but it was not really part of the formal model. It was part of formal models, for example, in the work by Hamblin and by Merin. And we will look into this specific negotiating aspect in conversation in this talk. I will talk about two proposals that refine this dynamic view here, insofar as they integrate aspects concerning the negotiation of assertions and the answering of questions. One is the table model by Farkas and Bruce that I present here in a slightly simplified way. So this model assumes, in addition to the common ground, a specific way of listing the commitments of the participants here, S1 and S2, and a so-called projected set, PS, that indicates how the common ground should develop. So we have here these features. This is the common ground C, the commitments of S1, the commitments of S2, and the projected set that is here, the singleton set containing the common ground C. Now S1 asserts phi. This is the expression phi in blue. And the meaning of phi is this proposition phi. So this uh, puts phi into the projected set. And this is because S1 commits to phi and by this commitment wants to enrich the common ground phi. Now S, S2 can accept this by saying yes and then phi becomes part of the common ground. So, and this is the way how this is modeled. S2 commits to phi as well and as a result the common ground here increases by containing phi as well um, and the commitments, this, the specific commitments of S1 and S2 are emptied because they became part of the common ground here. S2 can also deny by saying no, then phi does not become part of the common ground. We have this situation, S2 commits to not phi, and this leads to a situation in which C is not enriched. Now, how does asking a question work? Assume that S1 asks whether phi is the case. In this case, S1 does not commit to phi, of course, but enriches the projected set so that it contains one branch, if you wish, C union phi, and one branch C union non-phi. In this case, 
S2 can answer with yes, leading to this result. So S2 commits to phi and phi becomes part of the common ground. Or S2 can answer with no, and in this case S2 commits to non-phi, of course, and non-phi becomes part of the common ground. And in either case, the projected set returns to a singleton set. So the issue is settled whether phi or not phi is the case. This is a very uh, interesting approach. There are some problems. So one is that we often agree to an assertion by just saying OK. And if we are speaker S2, we are not responsible for phi. We don't have to commit ourselves to phi. So the difference between reactions like yes and, and reactions like OK are not so clear. And secondly, this whole way assumes quite a lot of additional machinery for updating the common ground. And so we have to have separate lists for the commitments of S1 and of S2 and for the projected set. And, and there might be ways to combine this to a algebraically more manageable notion of common ground. Let's have a closer look at what we do when we assert. What are the reasons for accepting a assertion, the proposition that is asserted by a speaker? So one can see assertions as public commitments to the truth of propositions. This is a view that goes back to Charles and Peirce um, and has been enlarged and um, motivated by philosophers like Brandom, McFarlane, Hertz, and in a recent overview article by Shapiro. The public commitments are backed up by something like social sanctions that might be uh, just loss of face in case the proposition turns out to be false. And these social sanctions act as guarantees for the addressee to assume the truth of the proposition because the addressee knows that the speaker doesn't want to undergo these social sanctions and wants to keep up his or her esteem, as um, Charles Anders Pierce said. One view how this can work within the dynamics of assertions has been presented by Lauer. I give a slight twist to his story here. So there are several stages. So assume that C is a, a common ground and in, at this common ground S1 utters an assertion, asserts phi. This is a speech event. This is the first thing that, that happens in, con in conversation. The second step then is that this utterance is understood. The locutionary act is understood as a particular kind of speech event. So this is the first change of the common ground C to C prime with the information that this assertion has happened. Then the second step is that uh, this speech event is decoded in some sense and it becomes clear that S1 is committed to the proposition phi. This is the intended elocutionary act. And then in a third step, um, uh, S2 admits phi to the common ground. This is the intended um, effect, um, th the effect that S1 intends with this utterance. It is a perlocutionary act. It's something that with the illocutionary act is intended. It's the first perlocutionary act. There might be other perlocutionary acts like, so for example, if I assert that it is raining, then I don't only want that you believe that it is raining, but I also want that you take secondary actions, like for example, that you take an umbrella with you. The importance of commitments led me to the introduction of a new framework, the commitment space framework that I will introduce here. It starts out with a notion of commitment states. These are in some sense the same as we had before, so sets of propositions. I call them commitment states because commitments are the basic steps for updates, especially for assertive updates. These commitment states contain propositions of the form lambda i s, where s is a participant in the communication, is committed to the truth of phi in i. 
For short, I write S turnstile phi for that proposition. We have certain integrity constraints, like it is not possible that in the same commitment state C, both the proposition that S is is committed to phi and the proposition non-phi are a part of this commitment state. So if, if one participant commits to phi, this excludes non-phi in the commitment state. And now there is a generalization of this notion of commitment states to commitment spaces, CS. These are common grounds with a look ahead feature in some sense, namely sets of commitment states um, so a commitment state with possible continuations. This is an example of such a commitment space. So we have a basic or root commitment state C with possible continuations. C can be updated by phi for example or by psi or by non-phi or by non-psi and these can be further updated to a commitment state in which phi and psi are the case. This commitment state C, or rather the set that contains C, is the root of C. So in general the root of C is the set of commitment states C in the commitment space big C such that there is no C prime in C that would be a subset of C. We can update commitment spaces with a proposition. So the update with the proposition phi, for which I write dot phi here, is a function that takes a input commitment space C and restricts it to those commitment states in C in which phi is an element, the proposition phi is an element. Uh, for example, if C0 is updated by dot phi, I get the set of commitment state C in C0 that contain phi as a proposition, as an element. And I will also render this as, or typically render this as C0 plus dot phi. As an example, if our commitment space C here, the first one is updated with dot phi, I don't write the dots here, we get this gray commitment space as the update of C with phi. Let us have a look at how assertions in commitment spaces work. Let's take this as an example of a commitment space with a, with a proposition that expresses a commitment as one is committed to phi. Recall that if a participant S is committed to phi in a commitment state, then non-phi cannot be an element of C. I've constructed this example here as a commitment space that contains the propositions phi, non-phi, psi and non-psi and the integrity constraint that I just mentioned and the integrity constraint I just mentioned excludes the commitment state in which S1 is committed to phi and non-phi, the output commitment space. Actually this is not quite right because with a commitment to a proposition a speaker performs a update not only of the of the content of the information but the speaker changes the world itself before this update the world did not contain the commitment after that it does contain it and so this would have to be modeled by performative updates not by informative updates. This notion of performative updates and a model for that has been introduced by Sabolci in 82. I've talked about this in an article in 2014 but the nature of this update will be neglected here. We will do as if this would be a simple informative update for reasons of simplicity. Now the second step is the introduction of the proposition phi itself. This can be seen as the perlocutionary act in which the proposition phi itself is introduced and we get this as a result. We have a commitment space in which we have a root in which S1 is committed to phi and phi is the case as well. 
and of course everything that was in the commitment state C is also in this route here. We see then that an assertion consists of two steps, a elocutionary act in which the speaker commits to a proposition and a second perlocutionary act in which the proposition phi is introduced into the commitment space. But of course this does not guarantee that phi becomes part of the commitment space and in my article in 2015 I categorized a way how to model reactions to assertions. These reactions to assertions can be seen as second pair parts in the sense of conversation analysis by the address C S2. One reaction is OK, this signals acceptance. Uh, this can be also expressed by nodding or by uh, non-reaction in some sense. This means that after that phi actually is accepted into the commitment space. The second reaction is what I call confirmation which can be expressed by yes or yes you are right. In this case phi is accepted in the commitment space but is to the address C is himself committed to phi. And there is of course the possibility that S2 says no, this is a dissent. In this case we would like to update the result here with S2 is committed to non-phi but this update is not possible due to the integrity constraint uh, because it cannot be the case that S2 is committed to non-phi and phi is also in a commitment state. So the idea in my article was to retract to the previous commitment space C plus S1 is committed to phi without phi and then update this with the with uh, S2 is committed to non-phi. This results then in a commitment space in which S1 is committed to phi and S2 is committed to non-phi. This records that S1 and S2 have different commitments about phi. This is not a contradiction, this is allowed. S1 and S2 have different opinions about phi. I suggested a modeling of this by commitment space developments. These are sequences of commitment states. This is similar to the notion of a dialogue in Hamblin's article as a sequence of locutions. So this is an example of such a sequence indicated in angled brackets. So the end of the sequence consists of the commitment space C, C updated with S1 is committed to phi and then this further updated with phi itself. Now we want to update this sequence with S2 is committed to non-phi. This is not possible because of the integrity constraint. So we retract to the last compatible commitment space by an operator retract. So when we take this commitment space development and apply retract, what we do is that we add the, the next to last commitment space C plus S1 is committed to phi at the end. So and this becomes then the last commitment uh, space in this commitment space development CSD prime and CSD prime then can be further updated with S2 is committed to non-phi. The last commitment space is then C updated with S1 is committed to phi and S2 is committed to non-phi and in this sequence we have recorded the various stages that the conversation went through. I would like to explore here a different approach to reactions to assertions and to other speech acts. We have modeled assertions in some sense as an adjacency pair. The first pair part of an assertion is a commitment by the speaker S1 to a proposition and we have also a preferred second pair part. This would be the approval of this proposition, the acceptance, this is phi here. And uh, a dispreferred second pair part, this would be the dissent that S2 commits to non-phi. This is another way of reacting to an assertion that has to be accounted for. Now with commitment space developments we assume a additional complex structure that preserves the full history of the conversation. So a commitment space development like this here updated by an act A 
uh, for example, the update with a proposition, consists by taking the last uh, commitment space and adding a copy of it and update this commitment space with A. Um, this would be in some sense the preferred continuation and for the non-preferred uh, continuation we assume that A cannot update CN and so therefore we have to put this retraction operator into it so that we go back to the next to last uh, commitment space CN-1 and update this with A. So this was the idea. Now the new proposal is that we make use of the look ahead property that commitment spaces have anyway to model the preferred second uh, pair parts of assertions but also account for the dispreferred second pair parts and so we don't need this additional structure of commitment space developments that might be seen as a kind of overkill because it preserves the full history of a conversation. Then let's see how we can make use of the full potential of commitment spaces getting rid of commitment space developments. This means that commitment spaces would have to do the work of retraction. For this we have to define certain operations on commitment space updates. And I will illustrate this with this commitment space here that consists of a root C that can be updated with phi, with pi, with non-pi and with psi. And these are all the possible continuations. The first operation that we define is incremental conjunction of updates. So C updated with A semicolon B, this stands for the incremental conjunction, is simply C updated with A updated with B. We have seen something like that before. Now we can combine A and B into one update. We also have Boolean conjunction of updates. So A and B is C updated with A intersected with C updated with B. This can be illustrated here. We have here C updated with phi and here C updated with psi and the conjunction of both is then the new commitment space with the root where C is updated with phi and psi. I write this like that and all the possible continuations. So this is Boolean conjunction. It happens to be also incremental conjunction. We get the same result here because we don't introduce discourse reference here and then incremental conjunction and Boolean conjunction amount to the same. The next operation is Boolean disjunction of updates A or B. This is C updated with A union C updated with B. This is illustrated here. The result here is C updated with phi or psi. We get as a result a commitment space with two roots or two elements in the root set, C plus phi and C plus psi. Then we have denegation of updates. The denegation of A is C minus C plus A. This is illustrated here. So this is C updated with the denegation of phi and this is the same as C minus C plus phi. We get the complement set within the commitment space of C updated with phi. We also can create updates from propositions. We've seen this already with informative updates, which was defined like that. So dot phi is lambda C, the set of commitment state C in big C such that phi is an element of C. We also have what I call subtractive update. Negative phi is lambda C, C minus this set that contains phi, where C is an element of C. In this case, we get here the same result as with the negation. And we have additive update. This is written like that, union phi, this is lambda C, C updated C union phi, where C is an element of C. This would be an example of that. I just indicated here that we form the root that consists of the root C union, the set that contains omega. So this is C updated with omega. All the follow-up commitment states for which this is possible also contain omega. Most of these operations are monotonic in the sense that C updated with a 
update function A is a subset of C, so we get smaller and smaller commitment spaces, except for additive updates and sometimes also subtractive um, updates. They can be non-monotonic. Okay, now let's take a new view on assertions. I take this here to be my example a commitment space. Let's familiarize ourselves with it. We have one root C. C can be updated with S1 is committed to phi, with S2 is committed to phi, with S2 is committed to non-phi, and then with phi itself, with non-phi, and then another proposition, psi and its negation, non-psi. So these are all the possible continuations. Certain continuations like for example S1 is committed to phi and non-phi are of course excluded. As I said the root is the set that contains C. We have these simple propositions and we have all possible combinations that follow the integrity constraint. Now let's assume that S1 declares commitment to the proposition phi. This is a illocutionary act. We have C updated with S1 is committed to phi. The gray commitment space here is the result of this update. But with an assertion a speaker also wants to put the proposition phi itself into the common ground. So this is the immediate perlocutionary act. The uh, uh, assertion then is a incremental update with S1 is committed to phi and phi itself. This is the result that we get in this case. We are not there yet because S1 also has to accommodate for a rejection by the other participant S2 and the way how we are going to model this is by a Boolean disjunction, here the disjunction sign, with S2 commits to non-phi. This is the result that we get in this case by this disjunction. We see that we have a double rooted commitment space with two roots, two elements in the root set, S1 is committed to phi and phi, and S1 is committed to phi and S2 is committed to non-phi. Now let us look at the possible reactions by S2. One reaction by S2 is what I call acceptance. S2 can signal this by saying OK. And the way how we can model OK is by a denegation of S2 commits to non-phi. S2 indicates I will not commit to non-phi. We get as a result C double prime here. This will be the result. S2 uh, signals that S2 will not commit to non-phi and as a, as a result we have a situation in which S1 is committed to phi and phi is part of all the commitment states in the resulting commitment space. So this means that phi gets established in C double prime. Another possible reaction is confirmation. S2 says yes and commits himself to the proposition phi. This means that C prime here is updated with S2 is committed to phi. And by this S2 also vouches for the truth of phi. And of course phi will be established in this case as well. This is what we have as a result. Both S1 and S2 are committed to phi and phi is part of the common ground. But S2 can also dissent and say no and then express a commitment to non-phi. Both S1 is committed to phi and S2 is committed to non-phi get established. This is the result here. S1 is committed to phi, S2 is committed to non-phi and the subsequent uh, commitment states and of course phi does not get established because this would be against the integrity constraint that if S2 is committed to non-phi then phi cannot be established in any commitment state. I would like to highlight here that we have treated with these reactions the second pair parts to assertions either acceptance or confirmations or dissents as suggested by the interpretation of the assertion itself. So the interpretation of the assertion by adding to the 
commitment S1 is committed to phi, the disjunction of phi and S2 is committed to non-phi provided the possibility for these reactions. You might ask what happens if S2 reacts in a completely different way and says something like psi, like today is Sunday. What happens then is the following. The commitment space is, we add to the commitment space phi, but notice that the resulting commitment space does not establish phi yet. This is still a unresolved issue that appears here in the fact that the root of this commitment space still has two members. The issue is in some sense still in the air. Now let's go back to the state in which S2, the other speaker, dissented and said no. This was our state. And we ask what are now possible reactions by S1 to this dissent by S2. One possibility is to insist. S1 can say yes or in German doch. This means that S1 stays with the commitment to phi. And we see that when we add this information to C double prime, the output after this descent, nothing changes. So of course phi is not established and not phi is not established. We still are in the same state. Now S2 can also insist and say no. What happens then is that again nothing changes. We stay in the same state C double prime. Nothing has changed. This can go on as one can insist and say yes or doch and so on and so on. A situation that is well known as illustrated in this cartoon. So this says, oh children, just stop with this no yes, no yes or nein doch, nein doch nonsense. This doesn't lead to anything and the children say doch, nein, doch, nein, doch and so on. But there's a way out of this yes no game. S1 or S2 can retract his or her claim by saying OK or O. Oh. Something that is made famous by Louis de Funé, the French comedian. Um, so you find t-shirts like that. What does giving up one's claim mean? It means that it means that S1 retracts the claim to phi, retracts the commitment to phi. We have this retraction operation, the negation here. So the result of that would be this meaning from the previous commitment space, the commitment that S1 is, to, is committed to phi is retracted. We get this as a result. In the second stage, the speaker S1 can say you are right. And then this would be enlarged by the negation of phi. The first speaker S1 agrees now with the second speaker and this would be the result. In this case S2 is committed to non-phi and non-phi gets established in the commitment space. These are updates of course that are non-monotonic that change something so S1 changes a commitment that has been made before the commitment to phi. Let us compare this to the paper by Arthur Marine which presents a automata theoretic modeling Marine models discourses as transitions between states. There is a resting state as zero here. And there is one transition now typical for assertions, a claim. So speaker S makes a claim that phi and we get into a new discourse state S1. The other speaker S2 can concede and say that yes, I agree with that. And we go, go back to the original state is zero with the exception that the proposition phi itself is updated. This corresponds to the move of saying OK, indicating that one would not claim something different in our proposal. The other possibility is that speaker S2 denies, expresses a denial. This corresponds to our commitment to non-phi this gets us into a different discourse state S3. From there speaker S1 can insist. This corresponds to an insistence of S1 to phi. So we get back to S1. 
Uh, this is the same as a claim by S1 to file a additional claim and this can go back and forth indefinitely if you wish or speaker S1 can retract this gets the speaker into the state S3 gets the disc this gets the discourse into the state S3 and by doing this non phi the negation of phi is added to the common ground the current proposal is quite similar except that the claim followed by a denial is a possible resting state so this is S1 is committed to phi and S2 is committed to non phi so S1 and S2 have agreed to disagree and neither phi nor non phi can be added into the common ground this was not a option in the model by Marine and in addition the concession by S2 for phi can be modeled as the denegation that S2 commits to non phi and in addition to the concession by S2 to phi which we model as the denegation that S2 commits to non phi we also have confirmation that S2 also commits to phi this is an additional move so there are two different agreeing moves to a claim by a speaker Let's compare this proposal also with Farkas and Bruce and my own previous work. In the table approach by Farkas and Bruce, we have that yes expresses acceptance and no expresses rejection of the projected set PS and there's no separate treatment of OK. And with yes, no record of the original commitment by the original speaker is retained and with no the original commitment by the speaker is deleted there is no record that the speaker claimed something that did not become part of the common ground with the commitment space development approach OK and YES were simple continuations and NO was a more complex continuation that requires a retraction operation retract and this is not the case anymore so it seems that both ways of saying OK or YES on the one hand or NO on the other are continuations so there's no difference between OK, YES and NO it seems but one could say that S1 actually prefers a reaction by S2 by YES or OK over a reaction by NO S1 wants that his assertions become common ground one can assume that there is a plausible pragmatic rule that people want to avoid conflicting commitments so a commitment that S1 is committed to phi and S2 is committed to, to non phi is not optimal so among the continuations that are proposed by an assertion so either S1 is committed to phi and phi gets established or S1 is committed to phi and S2 is committed to non phi which, which I mark red here the red marked uh, commitment states are dispreferred so this effectively would introduce a preference on continuations or if you wish on second pair parts of adjacency pairs we account both for the preferred continuation and also for the non-preferred continuations because the speakers are committed to contradictory propositions Response particles do a lot of work in this mechanism of updates based on previous work of mine and other work by Rolofsen and Farkas and Klaus, Rep and myself I would like to go a little bit into the functioning of these particles we assume that the TP of the antecedent clause introduces a propositional discourse referent that can be picked up by response particles so for example the sentence it is raining has a TP um, and above that is something that I call act phrase that uh, introduces the assertion specific uh, turnstile operator here but the TP introduces a propositional discourse referent P for the proposition it is raining so for the proposition phi this means and with OK OK picks up P and expresses the denegation of the negation of phi as we have seen yes would pick up P and express that S2 is committed to phi as well and no also picks up P and expresses that S2 is committed to its negation 
negated antecedent clauses now introduce two propositional discourse reference for the TP and for the neck phrase so P for it is raining and non P for it is not raining and now OK can pick up P bar for it is not raining and uh, indicate the, the denegation of the negation of that so it is negated that S2 commits to phi um, and yes can pick up either P or non-P and this will lead to different results to the confirmation of phi in contradiction to what S1 said or the confirmation of non-P so in agreement with, with what S1 said no can pick up P leading to the agreement to what S2 said or no can pick up non-P leading to the double negation of phi so S2 is committed to phi expressing disagreement so this would be the German doch we have different tendencies in the uses of yes and no between European and East Asian languages that are discussed by Holmberg now OK, yes and no are certainly not the only reactions to assertion so let us look at other reactions like maybe or perhaps and so on for this we first look at weak assertions assertions weakened by epistemic operators like for example it certainly will rain it probably will rain and so on uh, also um, expressions like it will rain I assume so epistemic lifting constructions or uses of epistemic verbs like it is wet outside it must be raining so the must here in this case we can analyze these cases as involving a commitment to a subjective epistemic attitude what I mean with this is that a speaker as one can commit not to a proposition phi directly but to the proposition that S1 the speaker is certain that phi in the case of it certainly will rain and by that still try to put phi into the common ground the assertion it certainly will rain is considered weaker than the assertion it will rain because this commitment here by S1 to his own epistemic attitude is easier to defend if it turns out not to be raining and still this can be used to put the proposition phi into the common ground it's a safer way in some sense there is a well-known interaction with negation we cannot negate epistemic adverbs or subjective epistemic operators we cannot say uncertainly it is raining or it is raining I don't think the reason why this is so is that if the commitment by S1 is that S1 is not certain that phi then this does not provide the necessary backup for introducing phi itself the pragmatic support in some sense epistemic adjectives like certain are different they can be negated it is not certain that it is raining is fine it is uncertain that it is raining is fine and this shows that certain is sort of part of the proposition itself and not outside of the proposition itself that is to be introduced into the uh, common ground so one can model this by saying that epistemic adjectives express a objective epistemic modification is something like it is certain that that it will rain and as one commits to this proposition about a objective certainty there are similar phenomena with evidentials like with sensory evidentials like it is apparently raining or reportative evidentials like like according to the weather report it will be raining we again have that these operators cannot be negated and they work in a similar way that they mitigate the thing that a speaker commits to to a sensory evidence or to a second-hand report evidence now we can explain what weak confirmation is about namely it signals non-objection against a proposition 
An example in this goes back to in Corvati and Schlöder, who have a different take on weak assertion that I cannot go into here. Uh, if S1 is saying it is raining, S1 adds the information that S1 is committed to phi with the wish to, in, to introduce phi. This joint with S2 is committed to non-phi. S2 can now react with perhaps, adding the information that S2 is committed to S2 holds phi possible, resulting in C double prime. Now we can assume a plausible integrity constraint that it is not allowed that S commits to non-phi and S holds phi possible in the same commitment state C. Hence this update by S2 expressing that S2 holds phi possible is a acceptance of phi because S2 did not do anything to prevent phi from being accepted. In a refinement, we can say weak confirmation is asserting a epistemically modified proposition. So if S2 says perhaps, then S2 commits to S2 holds phi possible. And by saying that, S2 introduces that it is objectively possible that phi into the common ground. Now we can assume a pragmatic rule saying that one should base one's reasoning on the common ground with the epistemic uh, proposition in the common ground that has the greatest support. So in C double prime, phi is supported by S1 is committed to phi and possibly phi is supported by S2 is committed to S2 holds phi possible, which introduces it is possible that phi. And of course it is possible that phi is also supported by S1, S1 committed to phi. And we should reason with the proposition phi in the common ground only to the extent it has the most widespread support. We can only assume that phi is possible because all participants S1 and S2 consider phi possible. In addition to weak confirmation, we also have a weaker kind of dissent. So far we have treated a strong dissent. So illustrated here, if S1 says, so S1 says 62,203,759 is a prime number, S2 could say no, it is the product of 631 and 99,689. There's also a weak descent that is illustrated in the following example. S1 says the same sentence and S2 says no, it might have very high prime factors. So with this no, S2 doesn't say that this number is not a prime number. S2 just warns that the conclusion that it is a prime number might not be correct. How can we model these descent types? So let's assume that the assertion is as we said before. Now the strong descent by S2 prevents phi from becoming established in the common ground. And with a weak descent we can have this assumption that the weak descent expresses the a negation of the commitment of S2 to phi. So this excludes that S2 becomes committed to phi and there can be a plausible integrity constraint stating that it is not possible that phi is an element of C and that the negation of a commitment to phi, so the proposition that a participant is committed to phi is an element of the same commitment state. Weak descent can be then analyzed as asserting a epistemically modified proposition. This notion of weak descent has also been treated by Inkovati and Schlöder in a different way. So for example, if S2 reacts to a assertion with perhaps not, we'll analyze this as S2 expressing commitment to S2 holds not phi possible which introduces the proposition that it is possible that not phi 
into the common ground. There is a plausible integrity constraint that phi and S2 commits to it is possible that non phi are both part of the common ground, that this is not possible. We can take care of such weak rejections as possible moves. So if S1 asserts that it is raining, S1 commits to phi and wants to put phi into the common ground, but this is disjoint with any move by S2, the other person, that prevents assuming phi in C. And it's not only just the commitment of S2 to non-phi, but also, for example, the non-commitment of S2 to phi or the commitment of S2 to it is possible that non-phi. So these all would lead to to a situation in which phi cannot be accepted. We can illustrate this like that. So with an assertion, speaker S1 commits to phi and wants to introduce phi, but there is a disjunct, this, these are all these continuations, from which there is no way to assuming phi. So a assertion then consists of the disjunction between this gray area and the yellow area. And the yellow area would in some sense be the non-preferred uh, continuations, but they have to be accounted as well in case the other speaker does not go along with S1. And the white area here, these are the excluded continuations. Now we come to questions. What is a question? With a question, a speaker requests an assertion of a particular type, the answer to the question, from the addressee. We can model this by a restriction by the speaker of the possible continuations of the commitment space. In 2015, I modeled this in the following way. We have a question update, slightly adjusted from my earlier paper. Here, a question mark in front of a update function A results in this meaning a input commitment space C creates the output the root of C which remains unchanged union C updated with A. So for a question like is it raining which I call a monopolar ultimately biased question if S1 asks S2 this question then the commitment space C is updated with question dot S2 is committed to phi. So this is the root of C union C updated with S2 is committed to phi. This leaves the root unchanged and the only continuation that is allowed in this formula is that S2 should commit to phi. If this is the input commitment space, so we see here that the root C can be continued with, with S2 is committed to phi or S2 is committed to non-phi and then phi, non-phi, psi, non-psi. These are all the possible combinations. Then the question whether phi is the case, so is it raining, results in this great commitment space. So the root is unchanged because nothing is added yet to the root. And the only legal continuation is that S2 is committed to phi and then all the subsequent uh, possibilities that, that obtained already in the input commitment space. Now S2 can answer yes and agree to phi and put phi into the common ground. So this is a short assertion in some sense of the proposition phi and by this phi would be established. Or S2 can say no and update C prime with S2 is committed to non-phi, establishing non-phi. But now we cannot interpret this reaction in, with respect to this commitment space after the question. So therefore we have to go back, retract to a previous commitment space namely this one here, the original one, to which then we add the information that S2 is committed to non-phi and wants to introduce non-phi. So this would be the result then. So we have to do this step back, 
we have to retract, we have to go back to our previous commitment space and the question now is can we do without this kind of retraction? Let's see how we can treat questions without retraction. The first proposal is that a monopolar question like is it raining has this meaning. Uh, we have this question operator so the root of the input C stays constant and we have a modification S2 is committed to phi or phi or S2 is committed to non phi. So this S2 is committed to non phi is the else clause in some sense that allows for S2 to say no. Let's take this as this would result in this kind of commitment space where the yellow part is the part that is expressed by the OR condition. So this is uh, in case S2 is committed to non phi and all the possible continuations of that. Now possible responses or second pair parts are confirming yes it is. So S2 commits to phi and wants to put phi into the common ground. This is one possibility resulting in this commitment space or a descent S2 says no it isn't. S2 commits to non phi and puts non phi into the common ground. This is now possible because we have this yellow part in which S2 can assert non phi. But there are other second pair parts like for example I don't know. In this case we want to say that uh, S2 commits to the proposition that S2 does not know phi. This would exclude that S2 commits to phi or that S2 commits to non phi by an integrity constraint that is plausible, namely that it is not possible that the proposition that a participant S does not know phi and S commits to phi is in the same commitment state C and it's not possible that the proposition that a participant S does not know phi and S commits to not phi is in C. So these two constellations are excluded. In order to deal with such answers we need a more general uh, interpretation of the question as indicated up here. Something of the form question. So the root of C is unchanged. A union S2 is committed to phi or S2 excludes committing to phi. And this could be done for example not only by S2 commits to not phi but also by S2 says I don't know whether phi. So we can illustrate this in uh, by this schema here that looks similar to what we just had. Namely we have a disjunct of the sub area in which S2 commits to phi with the sub area of the input commitment space in which there is no connection to this gray sub area and we have the disjunction of these two parts and as this is a question the root C stays constant. Let us now look at other kinds of questions and we start with alternative questions and to be specific into alternative yes no questions of the type is it raining or not. One representation of that that is plausible is the disjunction therefore we have the or in this uh, question between the request that S2 commits to phi and the request that S2 commits to non phi. This would be this kind of meaning S2 commits to phi or S2 commits to non phi are the two possible continuations here. Possible responses or second pair parts are now not yes or no. This is disfavored as both phi and non phi are introduced as propositional discourse reference at the same level. The answer it is, it is raining is possible of course and leads to this commitment space. The answer it is not raining is possible as well and it leads to this commitment space. Again we have responses like I don't know in which S2 commits to not knowing that phi. 
For this, we have to have a more general representation of questions. Just as before, we have a disjunct between the continuation that S2 commits to phi or S2 commits to non-phi and that S2 excludes in some way or other any commitment to phi or not phi, for example by saying I don't know. We can, we can visualize this meaning with this diagram here. This is the continuation that S2 commits to phi. This is the continuation that S2 commits to non-phi. There are possible continuations from the root that do not lead to either S2 commits to phi or to S2 commits to non-phi. For example, if S2 commits to I don't know. And the disjunction between the gray parts and the yellow part here uh, would be the meaning of the question that um, allows for a straight answer or for some other way to react to the question by saying that by saying that S2 cannot make any commitment. And in a similar way we can deal with other questions, other alternative questions like did John dance or did Mary dance? An alternative question that is mediated by focus. We have focus on John and Mary, these are the alternatives. So the meaning of that is a question mark, so a request that S2 commits to John danced, or question mark, a request that S2 commits to Mary danced, or, and now the else condition, S2 excludes commitments to John danced and that Mary danced, to either one of these. Considerant questions have exactly the same meaning, they are expressed in different ways. A question like who danced can be seen as a generalized disjunction, a generalized disjunctive alternative question like did John dance or did Mary dance or did Sue dance. So we have here as the question meaning a generalized disjunction ranging over x where x is a person of a question mark uh, x danced or in case the well, address C uh, cannot answer or doesn't want to answer for all x uh, that are a person S2 excludes a commitment to x danced. It is interesting to look at assertions with question tags, a kind of mixed category. For assertions we had this meaning at least this was one meaning with a concrete else clause. So we had um, C is updated with S1 is committed to phi and phi itself or S2 is committed to non-phi leading to this meaning. We had this before with the two roots here, with the two element roots here. Uh, S1 is committed to phi and phi or S1 is committed to phi and then S2 is committed to non-phi. Now for questions we had this simplified proposal. The essence of the question is that the speaker S1 wants that S2 commits to phi. Doesn't change the root yet. Now a question tag like it is raining isn't it? Where the tag expresses the reversed polarity of the question can be interpreted in the following way that this is a disjunction between the assertion and the question that it is not the case that S2 commits to phi. This is what I proposed in 2015. To be more specific, we can have a stronger uh, interpretation here to illustrate how this type of reaction works in general, namely that S2 commits to non-phi. This is not my final proposal for these questions, but um, we can work with this better because it can be illustrated in a better way. In this case, this question would look like that. The yellow part here is, is represented by this area here. Now the reaction yes would establish that S2 is committed to phi and by this phi would be automatically established as well because both S1 and S2 would be committed to phi. 
the reaction no would establish that S2 is committed to not phi, leading to this result here. There's now no conflict as with the reaction no to a simple assertion because we don't have that S1 is committed to phi and S2 is committed to non phi. Rather, now S1 can insist and stress S1 is committed to phi, and this would prevent phi from becoming a common ground, or S1 can accept with OK, and this would establish non phi. Now let's take stock what we've done so far. We have model discourse moves with preferred continuations as second pair parts, making use of the look ahead feature of commitment spaces. We have assumed that an assertion consists in the commitment of a speaker S1 to phi and the preferred continuation that phi is accepted in the common ground. For questions, we have assumed a monopolar question that the speaker S1 restricts the possible continuations to S2 committing to phi or to S2 committing to phi or S2 committing to non phi in the case of bipolar alternative yes no questions. But we also have seen that we can take care of the non preferred continuations or second pair parts in a way that is different from retraction as I've proposed previously, but rather we have a kind of disjunct um, in the update that takes care for the elsewise continuations. So for example, for assertions, we have this disjunction with any move by S2, the address C that prevents assuming phi. And similarly for questions, we have a disjunction with any move by S2 that prevents assuming phi. Now we are coming to the end, but before I end, I would like to talk about two more kinds of speech acts. One is greetings. Now what is a greeting? There are many different forms and specialized functions. For example, wishes like good morning, recognitions like hello, questions like how are you? Vocatives like Hey John can be also seen as a kind of greeting or non linguistic greetings like wavings or whistles. The common function that is relevant here is that with a greeting we recognize a person that is technically identified by gaze or by the vocative as a conversation participant. This means as a possible referent for the second person pronoun now. So this means the essence of the greeting is like that. Uh, when S1 says to S2 hi, then the commitment space C is updated by the proposition S1 recognizes S2 as conversation participant. And this is then the output C prime. There's no commitment involved. By greetings, the speaker S1 just makes this proposition true. This is similar to performative updates, like if S1 says as the host at a dinner table, the buffet is open, then if S1 is authorized, then the proposition the buffet is open becomes true. Now, a greeting and a counter greeting, how can this be uh, dealt with? Um, the counter greeting is a second pair part of an adjacency pair, obviously. So we can incorporate into a greeting the expecting greeting by the other person. This would be done as follows. If at the input C, S1 greets S2 with hi, C is updated by the proposition that S1 recognizes S2, followed by the expectation, so question mark, so the root doesn't change here, that S2 recognizes S1 as well. So a greeting um, is always followed by the expectation that the other person greets back. If S2 does not recognize this greeting by greeting back, S1 can greet again. So S1 says hi, S2 says nothing, S1 says hi there. So this suggests the following modeling. If at C, S1 greets S2 with hi, 
then C is updated with S1 recognizes S2 or in case there is no evidence that S2 realizes that S1 recognizes that S2. So in this case the greeting has not been established yet because it was not recognized. This disjunction then defines the output commitment space C prime. Now the preferred continuation is that S2 says hi back and by this it's clear that, that the proposition that S1 recognizes S2 is established as well. And the non-preferred continuation is that there is no evidence that S2 realized that S1 recognized um, uh, S2 as a conversation partner. And at this situation S1 can say hi again trying his luck again. And finally let's talk about commands and promises. There are a lot of existing analysis of commands in dynamic semantics among others for a sentence like do the dishes partner assumed that we add do the dishes to the to-do list. This is a separate dimension of the common ground. Kaufmann assumed a performative update of the common ground C with a deontic statement like S2 must do the dishes. Star assumed that imperatives impose a preference order on propositions P in the common ground C so that the ones in which S2 is doing the dishes are preferred over the ones in which S2 do, uh, does not do the dishes. Barker and I myself in unpublished work um, assumed that commands restrict the possible continuations by actions of the address C. Now here I would like to start with promises. Promises can be seen as performative speech acts that make a future proposition true. That just impose that a proposition is true. So if S1 promises to S2 I hereby will do the dishes or I promise hereby that I will do the dishes then C is updated with S1 the speaker will do the dishes. So this future proposition is made true by this act of the speaker. This obliges the speaker S1 to actually do the dishes of course. There is a difference to predictions about the future. If S1 says to S2 Two, I will do the dishes and just means this as a um, are not realized as specialized speech acts. The promises can be accepted or declined and in the spirit of this uh, proposal here the speech act of promise should include the possibility that the addressee will decline the promise. This can be expressed by a disjunction again that with the update that S2 excludes that S1 will do the dishes. Any way that S2 excludes that S1 does the dishes will relieve S1 from the promise. This meaning also allows for verbal reactions like OK, yes or nice and no, don't do that and I would not like to do that and so on. Now let's come to commands. Commands are speech acts that request from the addressee to make a future proposition true. They are similar to promises but now the addressee is involved in the proposition. So if S1 says to S2 do the dishes then C wants to restrict the actions in such a way that the proposition S2 will do the uh, dishes becomes true. In contrast to a promise this has this question mark here uh, so the root does not change yet but the continuations are restricted in a way that the proposition S2 will do the dishes become true. And this of course would oblige S2 to do the dishes. In this sense commands are similar to questions. They also have this question mark so they don't change the root yet but restrict the possible continuations. But they are also different insofar as commands often do not require a linguistic action. So the question just to oppose this to the command will you do the dishes 
uh, would restrict the possible continuations of C to a commitment of S2 to the proposition that S2 will do the dishes. Again, we can account for acceptance and declining commands by a disjunction in this way. So do the dishes has a disjunction in which S2 excludes that S2 will do the dishes. This is to account for reactions like I cannot do this, I don't want to do this, I've done it already. And this also accounts for linguistic reactions like OK. OK will be a denegation of the negation of the proposition S2 will do the dishes effectively indicating that S2 does not exclude that S2 will do the dishes. Or S2 can say no and with no S2 commits to the truth of it's not the case that S2 will do the dishes and this of course is an exclusion that S2 will do the dishes and uh, an indication that the command will not be heeded. It's time to sum up. I've introduced here the notion of adjacency pairs derived from conversation analysis and argued that this notion should be integrated into a common ground-based approach of conversational updates. I showed that commitment spaces, this is the notion that we have a common ground with possible developments, seem to be well suited to express such adjacency pairs. In order to account for the continuations, we have updates that contain preferred continuations that are disjoint with the non-preferred continuations, allowing for non-preferred continuations as well. And I've sketched this for assertions, questions, greetings and commands. Here are the references. And I would like to thank Marvin Schmidt for discussions about adjacency pairs and please go to my website um, for further information. I'm writing an article about this topic and I would be happy to receive comments. Thank you very much.